on over here. I want you to meet my brother. Keith, this is Nat Springer. Pleasure to know you, Keith. Hey, you look marvelous. And you look prosperous. Well, I got a hundred suit of clothes, a 40-room mansion in San Francisco, but I am still the hungry kid that you knew in law school. <laughs> Can't get over how well you look. Backwoods law must agree with you. Well, now, I wouldn't exactly call Stockton backwoods. Yes, I know. I hear you've been doing pretty well yourself, as a matter of fact. Cattle, horses, gold mines, and a couple of thousand acres of timber. I would be happy to take off your hands if you will accept my client's generous offer. Now, Nat, that's what surprises me. What? Well, a famous lawyer like you involved in something so mundane as land purchase. Do I detect a note of envy in that statement? No, no, just surprise. Gentlemen, I'll tell you a little secret. Only a fool gets so famous that he turns down an honest dollar. Tomorrow at the hotel, I'll buy you some lunch. You two go ahead. I wouldn't want to get in the way of an old college reunion. Well, all right, but don't you get lost. I want you to witness some signatures later. Tony says he will. Come on! Charlie, get down from there. Three bottles, Charlie. I'll make it three, yeah? Come on now, Charlie. I'm counting on you, boy. What do you think, Doc? Well, I think you owe me twenty dollars. I mean him. I mean him. <laughs> Mr. Barkley, I'm only a dentist, but if you want my unprofessional opinion, I'd say he's still among the living. He got what he deserved. Came in here begging for booze. Oh, careful now, Gus. You're desecrating a sacred cow. Oh, Charlie Whitehorse here is an honest to goodness war hero. That's enough, Parker. Don't get yourself all riled up, Heath. Gus, here's an old friend, Second Georgia Volunteers. Just want him to know the truth about Charlie so he wouldn't call him a bum. See, old Charlie here's got a nose like a hound dog. One day he's sniffing around Chickamauga when he suppose he smelled. Booze? No, sir, he smelled an ambush. Saved his whole regiment, including Mr. Heath Barkley here, who's been licking his boots ever since. You hurt this man again, I'll kill you. You used to be the biggest eater in the regiment. In fact, you were the only man I ever knew that actually liked hardtack. I think about those days. You know, we got a half a dozen Bronx that need busting. You get yourself in shape. I'll talk to Nick. Nick would never take me back. He would if you'd quit the booze. Oh, 
It's a lot easier than falling off balconies, isn't it? I don't know. Charlie, I'll help you. Take you to our line shack, dry you out. Whip you like a father if you even mention whiskey. I never knew my father. I asked about him once, and my mother said he died in a saloon. Runs in the blood? Is that what you're trying to say? Listen, I saw you refuse whiskey while a doctor was cutting steel out of your body in four different places. You never even tasted the stuff until this town tried to make you a hero. Charlie the Conquering Hero. I never wanted it. Handling. I just wanted to be left alone. You let all the backslappers and handshakers turn you into a drunk. Let them turn you into the town bum, and that suited you just fine, didn't it? Charlie, all you got to do is say yes. I'll make sure you've got that job. You can start just as clean as the day you were born. Tomorrow morning, you'll be at the ranch. At 6 o'clock sharp. <laughs> You know, I was just thinking. Maybe we ought to invite Mr. Springer for dinner. Roast pork and apple pie might make him a little more receptive. <laughs> Don't kid yourself, Mother. He's not interested in the home cooking. All he wants to do is go back to San Francisco and tell that client that he got the land for a lot less than he expected to pay. You're not going to give in to him, are you? Oh, we'll shout at each other for a little while and both agree on the price we knew it was going to be all the time. That sounds like a lot of foolishness to me. Yeah, that's the way it's done. Aren't you going to eat your breakfast? What time is it? It's about 8 o'clock. You don't really expect Charlie to show up, do you? He just might straighten out if people around here would give him a chance. How many chances does it take? <laughs> And it deserves your most reverent attention. to come in here, boy. You just made the sourest mistake of your life. Sheriff, Sheriff, here, this way, quick. Maria. Wayne Maria. I'll have this report back. Don't waste your time. Dead as you get. And if Doc Tully had hit him with an axe handle, I'd be dead as Parker here. How about it, Doc? It's true. I saw it. He barked and shot Parker down like a dog. Too bad your brother wasn't killed. It'd been easier than hanging. Are you all right? He's got a lump in his head, but I don't think it's serious. 
Jared, they say I shot Parker. I know. I might have killed him with my bare hands, but not with a gun. Two eyewitnesses saw him shoot Parker. Three more saw him come in the barn, and maybe a dozen others heard him make threats. And the barrel of his gun was still warm when I got here. Heath, tell me what happened. I walked into the barn. I saw Parker and that, that other friend of his. Go ahead. That's all I remember. He's got a bump on his head. It's a wonder he can remember anything. Two eyewitnesses saw him shoot him. Said they saw him. I'm not a lawyer, Jared. I'm not going to argue with you. But this is something a jury will have to decide. Saves a hundred lives. When he dies, three people. Private Charlie Whitehorse. Killed in action by a barroom dandy and a second-rate traveling dentist. Hold at me. Yes, sir, don't you worry at all. Now, you take a big swig out of it. Big one. Ain't gonna hurt you. You better don't, huh? Afternoon, Jared. Afternoon, Doc. Don't let me interrupt. Let's go right on with whatever you're doing. Anything particular you want? No. Just taking a walk, Doc. I think a lot better when I walk. I hear they got a date set for the trial. Week from Wednesday, Judge Lansbury. What a mess. What a terrible mess. That little stunt that killed Charlie, Doc. People say that was your idea. God forgive me, I never thought he'd do it. Well, I wouldn't worry too much. Man's liable to think up all kinds of crazy things when he's had too much to drink. You'd like to make a fool out of me, wouldn't you? You'd like to get me up on that stand and say old Doc Turley was drunk, that this whole thing's a figment of his imagination. But it isn't. It happened. I saw him. He was insane. He shot Parker down like a dog. Where were you when the shots were fired? Well, I was over there by the door. Why'd you come in here? Why'd you go back in the barn with Doc Tully? I come to get some help. You must be some kind of a clairvoyant. What's that? You came for help before the shots were fired? Obviously, you knew something was going to happen. Well, I didn't figure they were sitting down to a game of cards. Did you see Parker go in the barn? No. Then how'd you know he was in there? He guessed. The same as your brother. Mr. Vanderveer, what a coincidence. I was just reading your statement over at the sheriff's office. Did you like it? Fascinating. I didn't believe a word of it. The sheriff does, and the jury will. What surprised me the most was that part about your being a land speculator. Well, that shouldn't surprise a smart fellow like you. I don't remember ever seeing any deeds registered under the name of Vanderveer. Atlas. That's the name on the deed. We were partners. Until your brother shot him down like a dog. You and Doc Tully keep using that same phrase. Shot him down like a dog. It's an adequate description. Funny you both should come up with the same one. Not as funny as that story your brother came up with. I'll bet he'll swear he doesn't remember a thing. Right up to the day they hang him. <laughs> I'm hungry. Oh, we saw Heath. Yeah, he finally found out what's wrong with old Sheriff Madden's stomach. It's his wife's cooking. Hey, we got a letter from Audra. Rained the whole time she was in Rome. She got three proposals the first day she was there, though. One from a bona fide duke. How do you like that? Jared, do you think it's fair not telling Audra about this? What good would that do? And, Mother, will you stop fussing around with that? Wait, you had Look, that I something. Look, I said I'm not hungry. Oh, you better come on home and get yourself some rest. You're going to be all burnt out by the time that trial starts. You take care of you, Nick. I'll take care of me. 
Well, maybe Heath's memory will come back. Even if it does, even if he screams his innocence to the heavens above, two eyewitnesses are going to stand up in court and swear that they saw him shoot Parker Atlas down like a dog. Parker Atlas wasn't worth his salt. That may be, but he was the son of one of the most respected ranchers in this valley, and don't think that won't count with the jury. And you want to talk about motive? There isn't a man, woman, or child in Stockton who didn't know how he felt about Charlie Whitehorse. Jared, I'm sorry. I saw a light here. I didn't know you had company. That's all right, Nat. Come on in. Um, Nathan Springer, this is my mother. How do you do, ma'am? My brother, Nick. Howdy. How do you do, Nick? What are you doing here, Nat? I thought you went back to San Francisco. My wife threw me out of the house. She literally threw me out of the house. She said, Nat, you haven't had a vacation in six years. If you don't get some rest, you're going to drop dead from a heart attack. That's all I had to hear, so I grabbed my bag, came back to Stockton, found the softest bed at the hotel, and there I intend to sleep for two solid weeks. Well, I hope you come out of hibernation long enough to have dinner with us. It would be a pleasure, ma'am. Oh, by the way, Jared, I've got some news for you. The news out of San Francisco is Danny Manis is going to prosecute your brother. Who? He wants to be governor, ma'am. You get to be governor by prosecuting cases that give you publicity. Is he any good? Well, let's put it this way, Nick. Hasn't lost a case in five years. Oh, I wouldn't lose any sleep over it. You'll be up against the best. Well, I, uh, I guess I'll run along. Uh, pleasure meeting you, ma'am. Nick, pleasure meeting you. Sir. Jared, if, uh, if you need any help, just, uh, just holler. Just a little vacation, huh? May we proceed with the selection of the jurors, Mr. Manis? You're Mrs. Bacon, aren't you? Mrs. Florence Bacon. Yes, sir. And now, Mrs. Bacon, are you acquainted with the accused? Well, I know who he is. Have you formed any opinion concerning his character? Well, he always seemed to be a real nice young man. Mrs. Bacon, are you aware that nice young men are capable of savage and lawless acts? They're capable, shall we say, of murdering other nice young men in fits of brutal rage. That's a totally inflammatory remark. It was not a remark, Mr. Barclay. It was a question. Your Honor, I must... If I follow Mr. Manis correctly, I think he wants to know if this lady is capable of rational judgment which is well within the limits of proper inquiry. This juror is acceptable to the prosecution, Your Honor. You're smiling, Mr. Hartzell. Is there something about these proceedings that amuses you? Very well, then. Let me ask you this. One of the prosecution's star witnesses in this case is a known drunk. Objection! Would you be willing to take the word of a drunk in a case that carries the possible penalty of death? What kind of an omniscient being do you think you are? Apparently, he knows what I'm going to do before I do it. Now, wait a minute. Everyone in town knows you're going to use Doc Tully. Silence! Oh, no, no, wait a minute. Before, he was bawling Jared out because he busted in. Now, he's doing the same thing. Order! Any more of that, and I'll try this case before an empty courtroom. Sit down, sir. Gentlemen, I think we had better adjourn until tomorrow morning. Come in. Oh, Victoria. You wanted to see me? Yes. Please, sit down. Whoever invented these things didn't have summer in mind. I'll wager ten years from now, judges won't even be wearing them. They're a holdover from the Middle Ages, when people were awed by ceremonial ritual and pomposity and all the rest of it. Victoria, I'm not even going to comment on Nick. But Jared, that's something else. That's something very, very dangerous. I know. A doctor doesn't operate on a member of his family. How can you expect a lawyer to act with any degree of emotional stability when he's defending the life of someone he loves? What would you advise? Get him off the case, Victoria. 
I don't care how you do it, but do it. Otherwise, Heath doesn't have a chance. Jared? Well, which was it? That famous story about how he took you to your first dance? Or one of his enlightened lectures on the obsolescence of the law? I saw you go into his chambers. Jared, Judge Lansbury sent for me. He's concerned about you. He feels that because of your personal involvement, you could use help. <laughs> I'm surprised he didn't ask you to have me withdraw from the case. You know, if this weren't so tragic, it'd really be funny. Daniel Manis, that great champion of justice, who'd sell his rotten soul for one line of publicity, comes all the way here to prosecute Heath. The presiding judge tells me I need help. And by sheer coincidence, one of the best lawyers in the state just happens to be registered at the local hotel. Because his wife throws him out of her 40-room mansion and tells me to go take a little holiday. Manus and Springer, those two alley cats. They've been waiting for the last five years just for the chance to tear at each other's throats. But if Springer could help us, does it really matter? That's the funny part. It does. There's not a thing I can do about it. I'll let the record show, Your Honor, that in addition to myself, the defendant will be represented by Mr. Nathan Springer of San Francisco. So, uh, you got nothing to say, huh? Well, Mr. Barkley's questioned me a dozen times. I'm tired of being questioned. That's what Manners told you to say, isn't it, Pete? Yeah, I don't have to say nothing uh, until he puts me on a stand. Well, that's true. That's true indeed. Just a darn shame. What was it? Little fellas like you, always getting caught in a squeeze. What do you mean? Well, it's obvious, isn't it? Hmm, not to me, it's not. Pete, let me give you a little lesson. Money is power. In San Francisco, I could have you killed for a dime. I saw what I saw. Oh, I'm sure you did, Pete. Mr. Springer, I saw what Good I evening, saw. Good Mr. Perkins. Come on in. Here's your answer from Chicago. You married, Mr. Perkins? Nope. Who do you talk to mostly? Now, look, mister. Anything that comes in over my wire is strictly confidential. An honorable man. Well, now, that's hard to come by these days. Thank you, sir. Heath was out of his mind. Insane. He fired once, bam! He fired twice, bam! And then Parker failed. Then I went back here, and I got this axe handle, and I sneaked up on him. And I got, wham! Right over here. Yeah, like Doc, it. yeah, fine. That's very dramatic. Don't play games with me, Doc. I've had you investigated by the best detectives in this country. Now that we, uh, understand each other. I don't suppose that you'll deny that you are married to a woman whose maiden name is Vera Henderson, who lives at 24 Elm Street, Chicago, Illinois. Well, what's wrong with that? Well, nothing, Doc, nothing. Except that you are also married to a woman whose maiden name is Alice Duggan, who lives at 111 Randall Terrace, Kansas City, Missouri. You trying to back me, I mean, that's what you're doing? Oh, Doc, temper, temper. The first time Charlie Whitehorse fell from that balcony. Now tell us what happened immediately afterwards. Oh, well, everybody gathered around. And did the defendant threaten Parker Atlas? Well, I'm not sure. You're not sure? What do you mean by that? Well, it was noisy in there. I'm just not positive of everything that was said. Well, you were positive when you were questioned by Sheriff Madden. You were positive when you spoke to me less than two days ago. No further questions. The witness is excused. The prosecution calls as its next witness, 
Dr. Arnold Tully. Mr. Manis, I'm told that Dr. Tully is not in the courthouse, that he left Stockton late last night. Congratulations, Matt. Oh, thank you, Jared. Thank you. Pretty neat day's work. Tully, McGinn. The old one, too. Wiped out before they ever hit the witness chair. Well, I always did believe in research. <laughs> Thought you'd be happier. I've never suborned a witness, Nat. The idea is to win. The idea is justice. Judd, you asked me to help you on this case. You knew exactly why I came back into this town. I need you and you need me. Let's stop your wailing about legal ethics. Right now, I'm just trying to save that boy's life. Why so glum? You should be dancing a jig. Don't you realize that half the prosecution's case went right down the drain today? I didn't like the way it happened. All that happened is that a couple of liars lost their nerve. Is that all there was to it? Heath, the trial is a very unpredictable thing. You never know how a witness is going to behave till they get right into that chair. Somebody got to McGinn. Somebody got to Tully. Process of elimination. I picked Springer. Jared, I've never known you to compromise before. Don't start now. Listen, Heath, I'm no saint. You think I can put a bunch of abstract principles about my own flesh and blood? But if I get my freedom, I want it clean. How do I live the rest of my life not knowing whether I murdered a man? Never knowing for sure whether I'm innocent or not? I've got to know. Well, then I'll tell you right now, you didn't do it. Jared, stop coddling me. I'm not sure anymore. I think and I think. And I know what Charlie meant to me. And I think about seeing him on that filthy barroom floor, wasted and disgraced. Why wouldn't I kill somebody who did that to him? Because I know you're not built that way. Jared, I could have done it. All right, Heath, let's go over it again. Every detail right from the very beginning. You were running down the alley. What happened then? I reached the barn door and again and Tully tried to stop me. I brushed him aside and rushed into the barn. I heard a noise, and that's when Vandiver and Parker got up from behind some boxes. Wait a minute. What noise? I don't know, just a noise. A noise from where? Think, Heath. From the loft. You heard a noise from the loft? T.J. <sighs> T.J. Dice? Dice was in the loft. Jared, he must have seen the whole thing happen. State your name, please. Gustavus S. Vandiver. Mr. Vandiver, what is it that you do? What is your occupation? I'm a land speculator. And I take it you own land here in Stockton? No, Mr. Atlas owned the land. We were partners. Well, how long did you know the deceased Parker Atlas? I met him during the war. Uh, same thing. Hey, look. I've turned this town inside out and upside down. He's gone, Jared. Nobody's seen him since the day of the shoot. Keep looking, Nick. That's when we decided to become partners. All right. Now, Mr. Vandenberg, please, tell us all exactly what happened 
After you and Parker Atlas entered that barn, uh, we kept quiet, hoping he wouldn't find us. He? Well, he's Barkley. Go on. But somehow he knew we were in there. I don't know, maybe he heard the door shut. But he knew, and he came to get us. Mr. Vanderbilt, exactly what do you mean by get? I mean kill. It was written all over his face. Craziness. He was practically slobbering at the mouth. Well, Mr. Vanderbilt, what, if anything, did you do? Well, we didn't stand still, and uh, we didn't have many choices. The back door was the only way out. So you headed immediately for that back door. That's right. The first thing I knew, I uh, heard a shot. That one missed. And then as I was trying to open the door, Barkley rushed up behind Parker, shoved his pistol into Parker's back. That was the one that did it. Parker's dead before he hit the floor. Mr. Vanderveer, how is it that you survived? Doc Tully. Uh, he hit Barkley with an ax handle. And so, Mr. Vanderveer, you saw Heath Barkley thrust his gun into the back of Parker Atlas and shoot him down in a fit of wanton rage. Yes, sir. I did. Your witness. Mr. Vanderveer, you say that you were a, uh, how did you say it, a land speculator? That's right. In Denver. Around Denver. And you met the deceased Parker Atlas during the war. That's right. Would you say that you uh, served with distinction? Well, I like to think I did. Mm -hmm. You two were in the same outfit, weren't you? The second, uh, what was it, the second Georgia volunteer? He was a lieutenant, I was a sergeant. Sergeant? That's right. Well, that's odd. Got you listed here as a private, Private August Davis S. Vanderveer. I would like to see what that is, please. It's an official document from the archives of the 2nd Georgia Volunteers. The names of men who deserted in the face of enemy fire. Gentlemen, I have a little present for you. Come on, get in there. Well, well. Hello, TJ. Where'd you find him, Nick? Hagersville, under a rock. You're going to get into a lot of trouble for this. Oh, really? Heath tells me he saw you in that barn, T.J. He's lying. I wasn't even in town. That's not the truth. I'm going to put you on the stand, T.J., and I can make you talk, believe me. It won't do you no good. Take him home with you, Nick. I'll get a subpoena from Judge Lansbury. Come on, T.J., come on with me. You can help me saw a little firewood. What? Firewood, you can help me saw it. No, no, see, you have more things to do for me. Yeah. Jared, are you out of your mind? You know what he could do to us? It's what Heath wants. Heath wants? Heath wants what? The truth, no matter what it is. As big a fool as you are. It runs in the family. Change his mind. His life is your responsibility. You didn't get to know him very well, did you? What's the matter with him? Has he got a guilty conscience? Well, let me tell you something about human nature, Jared. Weak. Be down on his hands and knees, thanking God for his deliverance. I've got an eyewitness, Nat, and I'm going to use him. You're going to hang your brother. That's what you're going to do. Now, that wouldn't bother you very much, would it? The only thing that gives you any pain is the thought of losing to Manus. You're the loser, Chad. He's your brother. <laughs> Would you state your full name, please? Thomas James Dice. Where were you last employed, Mr. Dice? Handyman in the saloon. 
I see. On the night that Parker Atlas was killed, were you in the storage barn behind that saloon? Yes, sir. What were you doing there? In minding my own business. I didn't ask you that. I was up in the loft, stacking whiskey cases. I see. And while you were in that loft, did anyone else enter that barn? Atlas, Van der Vern, your brother Heath came in. Will you tell us what you saw, Mr. Dice, after those men came into the barn? Nothing. Did you have your eyes shut? No. Now, Mr. Dice, this is a scale drawing of that barn. This is the figure of a man with his back against the farthest corner of the loft, a man of your approximate height. This arrow represents his line of sight. Now, you'll notice, with his back against the farthest corner of the loft, he has a perfectly clear view of the floor below. Now, I'll ask you again, Mr. Dice, what happened after those men came in? Please, leave me be. I don't want to get involved. You don't want to get involved. All my life, I've lived clean. Never no trouble, never. Walk away, don't get yourself mixed up in other people's messes. Have you ever for one brief moment thought what it would be like? What it really would be like to be in some terrible trouble and desperately need someone's help, only that person wouldn't give that help because they refused to get involved? Don't you think you've cowered from the responsibilities of life long enough, Mr. Dice, because this time you are involved? You were in that barn, and you saw Parker Atlas killed. I know it, the judge knows it, and the jury knows it. And if you refuse to tell us what happened, you will not only be guilty of perpetuating a worthless existence, you'll be criminally guilty of withholding evidence. T.J. All I want you to do is simply tell the truth. Nothing will happen to you. Nothing except maybe the beginning of a new life. You were in the loft stacking whiskey cases. Three men came in. Parker Atlas, Gus Vanderveer, and Heath Barkley. What happened? They started to argue, the three of them. Then Atlas moved toward your brother. They were going to fight it out because of what Atlas had done to Charlie Whitehorse. The other fellow, Vandever, he moved up behind Atlas and pulled his pistol. But he kept it hid behind Atlas' back. Go on. About that time, Doc Tully came in and picked up an axe handle. Your brother Heath didn't see him because he was watching Vandiver. He must have known that Vandiver had his pistol out because he said, get away from there. That's when it happened. Doc Tully swung the axe handle and drove your brother forward into Atlas, and Atlas got pushed back, and well, that's what did it. Did what? Killed him. Killed him? Yes, sir. Are you stating under oath that it was Gus Vanderveer's pistol that discharged and killed Parker Atlas? Just a minute. Mr. Barclay's gun was fired. It's here as evidence. Yes, but Mr. Vanderveer fired it. He told Doc Tully that if they didn't blame it on Heath, they'd have more trouble than they could handle. Thank you, Mr. Dice. Mr. Manis, do you have any questions? No questions. Case dismissed. <laughs> oh. Well, congratulations, Counselor. But I still think you were wrong. No reason for you to take that risk. There was plenty of reason, Mr. Springer. 
I had to know the truth. So long, Cheryl. Goodbye, Dan. Let's go home. All right. Keith, I'm mighty glad things turned out the way they did. But uh, I have to admit, I'm going to miss you around my jail. You know, this young man plays a pretty fair hand of poker. Well, which reminds me, Sheriff. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, now, don't look so sad, Fred. You can consider that payment for all that bad food you forced them to eat. <laughs> suit of clothes, a 40-room mansion in San Francisco, but I am still the hungry kid that you knew in law school. <laughs> Can't get over how well you look. Backwoods law must agree with you. Well, now, I wouldn't exactly call Stockton backwoods. Yes, I know. I hear you've been doing pretty well yourself, as a matter of fact. Cattle, horses, gold mines, and a couple of thousand acres of timber I would be happy to take off your hands if you will accept my client's generous offer. Now, Nat, that's what surprises me. What? Well, a famous lawyer like you involved in something so mundane as land purchase? I detect a note of envy in that statement? No, no, just surprise. Gentlemen, I'll tell you a little secret. Only a fool gets so famous that he turns down an honest dollar. Tomorrow, the hotel, I'll buy some lunch. You two go ahead. I wouldn't want to get in the way of an old college reunion. Well, all right, but don't you get lost. I want you to witness some signatures later. Tony says he will. Come on! Charlie, get down from there. Three bottles, Charlie. I'll make a tree. Come on now, Charlie. I'm counting on you, boy. What do you think, Doc? Well, I think you owe me twenty dollars. I mean him. I mean him. <laughs> Mr. Barkley, I'm only a dentist, but if you want my unprofessional opinion, I'd say he's still among the living. He got what he deserved. Came in here begging for booze. Oh, careful now, Gus. You're desecrating a sacred cow. Old Charlie Whitehorse here is an honest to goodness war hero. That's enough, Parker. Don't get yourself all riled up, Heath. Gus, here's an old friend, second Georgia Volunteers. Just want him to know the truth about Charlie so he wouldn't call him a bum. See, old Charlie here's got a nose like a hound dog. One day he's sniffing around Chickamauga what do you suppose he smelled? Booze? No, sir, he smelled an ambush. Saved his whole regiment, including Mr. Heath Barkley here, who's been licking his boots ever since. You hurt this man again, I'll kill you. Thank you. 
Matt Howard. Yes, fine. Come on over here. I want you to meet my brother. Keith, this is Matt Springer. Pleasure to know you, Keith. Hey, you look marvelous. And you look prosperous. Well, I got a hundred suit of clothes, a 40-room mansion in San Francisco, but I am still the hungry kid that you knew in law school. <laughs> Can't get over how well you look. Backwoods law must agree with you. Well, now, I wouldn't exactly call Stockton backwoods. Yes, I know. I hear you've been doing pretty well yourself, as a matter of fact. Cattle, horses, gold mines, and a couple of thousand acres of timber I would be happy to take off your hands if you will accept my client's generous offer. Now, Nat, that's what surprises me. What? Well, a famous lawyer like you involved in something so mundane as land purchase. Do I detect a note of envy in that statement? No, no, just surprise. Gentlemen, I'll tell you a little secret. Only a fool gets so famous that he turns down an honest dollar. Tomorrow at the hotel, I'll buy you some lunch. You two go ahead. I wouldn't want to get in the way of an old college reunion. Well, all right, but don't you get lost. I want you to witness some signatures later. Tony says he will. Come on! Charlie, get down from there. Three bottles, Charlie. I'll make it three. Come on now, Charlie. I'm counting on you, boy. What do you think, Doc? Well, I think you owe me twenty dollars. I mean him. I mean him. <laughs> Mr. Barkley, I'm only a dentist, but if you want my unprofessional opinion, I'd say he's still among the living. He got what he deserved. Came in here begging for booze. Oh, careful now, Gus. You're desecrating a sacred cow. Oh, Charlie Whitehorse here is an honest to goodness war hero. That's enough, Parker. Don't get yourself all riled up, Heath. Gus, here's an old friend, second Georgia Volunteers. Just want him to know the truth about Charlie so he wouldn't call him a bum. See, old Charlie here's got a nose like a hound dog. One day he's sniffing around Chickamauga what he suppose he smelled. Booze? No, sir, he smelled an ambush. Saved his whole regiment, including Mr. Heath Barkley here, who's been licking his boots ever since. You hurt this man again, I'll kill you. 